Hi, hello, good evening. Welcome everyone to Le Palais de Tokyo. I'm very happy uh, to welcome tonight this uh, public presentation of uh, the project uh, Tools for Demodernization, uh, dedicated towards transformative, systemic and sustainable change in art institution, organized by Kunst Institut Meli with the support of Terra Foundation. I personally feel very close to this thematic because as president of Palais de Tokyo since one year and a half now, I've been uh, um, rethinking the model of an arts institution from the inside through, personally, a broad ecological concept of institutional permaculture, which means how to um, be inspired by ecology to change perspective and spirit and also trying to break some spells that we inherited from the modernity. Uh, Palais de Tokyo is not a museum, it's a contemporary art center, but uh, it, was, uh, it hosted the first Museum of Modern Art in Paris. So that is why all those issues uh, are still in our walls and maybe in our minds. I would uh, like to uh, thank uh, Naomi Beckwith, Elena Filipovic, uh, Natasha Petrushin and Grace Enderitu for this evening. I will thank uh, Sofia Hernandez and all the team of Meli, all the team of Palais de Tokyo, of course, and I will really uh, warmly thank Terra Foundation for American Art, Francesca Rose and Elisa Shah. I hope you'll enjoy this evening, and uh, after the physical, we'll have now the more intellectual experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillaume. And um, I won't do the intellectual part, I would say I will do the more practical one. Uh, my name is Sofia hernandez Chancuy, and I'm the director of Kunst Institut Meli uh, for the past six years. And I am very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here and to um, have been um, yeah, in conversation with Guillaume uh, since his arrival to the Palais de Tokyo. And, uh, with his team as well to be able to discuss what are the ways in which both of our institutions can collaborate. Kunstinstitut Meli, formerly called Vite de Vite, Center for Contemporary Art, is also not a museum, it's a presentation institution, or Kunsthal in other words, so we do not have a collection proper uh, of art, um, although it does uh, present museum type exhibitions, the curatorial research that is uh, developed is original and uh, rigorous, and uh, the commissions that it develops uh, with artists, living artists primarily, is also quite experimental. I just wanted to give an introduction um, of what precedes tools for demodernizing. And um, as we just experienced right now with Grace uh, Nidiritu, an artist that um, just helped us to ground ourselves more in the present, uh, before the conversations will begin today. Um, I um, think that that's the exercise that the institution has been developing for the last uh, couple of years as part of its name change initiative. Uh, when we were uh, developing a name change from Vite de Vite to Kunstinstitut Meli, there had been a number of discussions, but also a number of trainings that as a team we had to uh, participate in to be able to understand not only how to cope with change, but also it's to understand where we wanted to go. What were some of the systemic problems that were being called upon in colonial namings that we were trying to uh, disengage from? And what was the trajectory that we wanted to set forth uh, as part of a renaming so that it didn't stay in the purely symbolic? So there are two initiatives that precede tools for demodernizing. One of them is uh, what we call uh, Tools for Collective Learning, and that's actually the title of the book of the Name Change Initiative that uh, looks into the entire, thank you, looks into the entire uh, years-long process uh, that was involved in making the name change. And it really is a book that actually focuses in the arts. The name uh, Meli comes from Ken Lam's artwork, uh, Meli Shum Hates Her Job, which is a billboard in the building. And the trigger for changing the name uh, develops from an exhibition by 
Wendelin van Oldenburg. So pretty much uh, from the beginning to end, art is centered at our institution and art is voice and intent very much discussed. Um, that proximity with the artist also allowed us to develop a second initiative right from the start uh, in 2018 that more recently we uh, refer to as tools for conviviality. And that has to do, uh, or it's rather an initiative in which we began using our white cube gallery spaces for social activities and discussing with the artists, uh, with some of them with uh, and through more conversation, with some of them with a little bit less, but the way in which they could develop art installations or we could bring existing art installations into Meli and be activating with them or with collaborators uh, the uses of that space. So there has been a, the initial space, which is the ground floor gallery space, that was the first space that was called Meli uh, by the Tools for Collective Learning program, uh, or rather Collective Learning in Practice that Jesse Quiman leads. And then there is 84 Steps, which is uh, about a three year a slowly evolving exhibition that we just closed that was called 84 Steps and that involved changing installations where a number of trainings took place. And one of the um, trainings and performances and a performance such as Grace uh, that we just experienced or a meditation experience or again an experience of being grounded in the here and now uh, and in the invitation to let go of uh, prejudice and be much more open and calm to listen it has been very much at the, uh, at the center of these activities. Tools for Demodernizing uh, is a, an initiative that will be introduced by my colleagues here and uh, Julia and Jesse will explain to you what it consists of uh, and also because today it is a day that we're celebrating the launch of an online chat book about it. So I will pass on the microphone to Yulia and Jesse, our curators, uh, to be able to discuss a little bit more of what that initiative is. Okay, so hi everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so a small introduction uh, on the program. First of all, my name is Jesse Guimon. I'm the curator of collective learning at Kunst Institut Mali, and I'm here with Julia Munkite, the curatorial assistant. And um, I'm going to give a small introduction on the program, what we did, and how it developed, and why we're here, basically. Um, so Tools for Demodernizing, uh, it's an initiative um, from Kunst Institut Mali, where we really were questioning, like, how can we demodernize institutions, basically? So we were looking for uh, ways of uh, transformation and change into institution, uh, in, yeah, institution uh, uh, existence. And for this, um, we figured that it would be very convenient and very fruitful to have this on a more global level as well. So for this program we figured, okay, what are the questions uh, that we're asking ourselves? What is change? Uh, what is demodernizing, basically? Um, so we had many questions uh, already, many discussions, uh, especially in this period of time, of course, where yeah, the public is also demanding a lot of change in the cultural and art centers. Um, so yeah, we um, developed a, a working group at Kunst Institute Mali that consists of me, Julia, Sophia, and Vivian Sihurl, who is the research and programs manager here. Uh, we also have some of our uh, colleagues from Kunst Institute Mali also in the audience uh, here with us as well. Um, yeah, so we um, worked on this already since uh, yeah, the end of 2022 we started. Um, and for this program, what I said already is like, we were looking for um, partners to work with, uh, how to make it more impactful, that it's not just an initiative that stays with us, but also that can spread, that can be uh, with more perspective uh, from other parts. Um, yeah, so that's something that Julia will discuss with you all. Uh, yeah, so uh, we uh, decided to invite network partners to develop this program together with us. It took a long time. We wanted uh, 
pe um, institutions uh, in different levels from yeah, museums that have been existing already for decades to we uh, were lucky to have a council that is about finding a new museum. Uh, so our par the partners that we ended up with, uh, who we also chose not just according to the institutions, but also knowing, um, looking for people that are already working um, with change and uh, transformation institutions. So uh, the first uh, institute, one of our network partners uh, is Artspace uh, from Sydney, Australia. Uh, from there we had Alexi Glass, the director, and uh, Michelle New Newton, who's here today, Michelle? Yes, hello, Michelle. Um, then um, the, uh, the next partner was Initiating Council for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Pristina, Kosovo. We have both Earl uh, Rogova and Ermere Karsniki here. Yes, hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, then we had uh, Yavit UP in Pretoria, South Africa. So we had Gabi Nikobo and... Uh, um, um, oh my God, Jesse. Elroy oh. Phyllis Bell. Sorry, uh, and then uh, from Colombia, uh, we have Museo de Arte Moderno de Medellin, or a uh, short uh, MAM. Uh, we had uh, Maria Mercedes Gonzalez and Emiliano Valdez joining us, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, uh, as it's a bit far. Uh, but they were there for us uh, in the June intensive that Jesse's gonna talk about. And that, so these were the institutional partners, most of them you can see in this beautiful picture. <laughs> Uh, and then we also had, um, rather not uh, a partner, but rather um, uh, Sophia had um, uh, led a postgraduate uh, seminar at CUNY Graduate Center in New York, uh, where uh, postgraduate students together with uh, Sophia developed a bibliography and uh, delved into kind of research uh, for, that um, also acted in some ways as a starting basis for our uh, own um, investigations on uh, tools for demodernizing. Uh, so uh, we had, um, uh, uh, yes, one second. <laughs> uh, Araceli Bermounts Enriquez, Elisa Guterres, and Miller Schulman, who's here today as well. Hey, Miller. Um, and um, uh, they prepared um, an annotated bibliography that we later expanded on as part of the project, and that's part of the chapbook. And then Araceli, together with Daniel Browning, a journalist, were also correspondents of um, the June program uh, that uh, joined, uh, as a, in a way, as witnesses that are outside of the institutions to also um, have a different perspective on what, we, what were our findings and what we did in our June intensive. And uh, talking about the June intensive, Jesse's going to tell us a little bit about what that was. Yes. So what we did, basically, uh, from the very start, uh, like I said, we started in November 2022. So when we had established the network partners, uh, we made gatherings online, uh, of course, in the beginning, um, where we already discussed our internal questions, but then also, of course, for every institution that we were uh, partnering with, like how do you see this? What, what, what is demodernizing to you? So we had these questions like, what do we want to learn? Uh, where do we want to go? And it was really a co-creation process. So from the beginning we discussed like, okay, what kind of program do we want to uh, develop all together? So we had uh, several online meetings uh, from November uh, 22 to uh, up till the summer. And we were basically working towards an uh, intensive training program that happened in June this year, which uh, was a three-day program at Kunst Institut Melli in Rotterdam. So we invited all uh, partners to come to Rotterdam to have this program with us. And basically what we did um, is that we had um, workshops and master classes, we had dinners, we had uh, networking uh, sessions. We, had, uh, we started with a master class from uh, Elemental who had written the book uh, Co-Create or Die, which was a very theoretical uh, approach to co-creation for us to discuss and understand what co-creation actually is. Uh, we had a workshop from Key Culture and that was more about sustainability so that we could think about how do we make our institutions uh, sustainable and how do our yeah, ideas and, and programs uh, contribute to that. Um, this is a snapshot from that workshop from sustainability. 
Um, we also implemented um, haptic workshops, so actually the same what we did today, how we started. Uh, we also implemented that in this three-day intensive uh, program, also because of uh, not just um, to have a balance basically between only the intellectual, the talking and the discussing, but also to be a bit uh, in our body and also to give ourselves time to process all the information that we had shared, obviously. So we had two uh, haptic workshops. One was from uh, Nikola Machalova from uh, HIPSI, and that was more a uh, meditation and consciousness uh, workshop. And the other one was from Romy Tillman from The Pulse, which is an organization that's focusing on body movement and aesthetic dancing. Uh, so we danced together, which created uh, bonding, <laughs> basically. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, we also um, went on certain field trips in Rotterdam to show the city, basically, to our network partners to introduce some of the areas, but also to visit um, two other institutions that we thought uh, were like, yeah, leading institutions in uh, practicing co-creation and working with communities, which were the Hip Hop House in uh, Rotterdam and um, Verhalenhuis Belvedere. And we ended the three-day intensive program with uh, more dancing. We invited um, <laughs> uh, DJ Mo Laudi, uh, a South African um, multidisciplinary artist, curator uh, and composer. He gave uh, a DJ lecture uh, for us and it was also, yeah, at the end of the three days, which were kind of internal uh, with our own group. And this event was then also for the public. So we also invited and engaged the public to, yeah, come dance with us, basically. Um, so that's a picture right there in the space where uh, Sophia was talking about, Melly. And um, yeah, these three days uh, we also included uh, network dinners where we also invited uh, some of our stakeholders uh, from other institutions from Rotterdam um, yeah, to connect basically and to expand the network uh, there. Um, yeah, and from all these workshops and these discussions we had of course many questions, many uh, talks, conversations, many thoughts, many ideas. Um, so that, of course, we had to kind of, uh, yeah, combine into some sort of, yeah, developing conclusion, I would say. Um, so that is uh, what Julia will tell you now. Uh, yeah, so today we're here to launch the chapbook, which is a microsite. Uh, uh, I believe it's tfd.consistentmelly.nl. Uh, and uh, the chapbook is basically our findings, or rather, our ongoing questions, as Ul in his reflection kind of said, that this was one of the experience, one of, a big part of the experience was rather than finding answers, we realized that it's about asking, continuously asking questions. Um, so the chapbook um, uh, delineates all the different parts of um, uh, of the process that we've uh, talked about and that has reflections from the different network partners. You can see there's a whole, like, contents. Um, uh, but uh, I want to mainly uh, introduce the kind of key terms that we thought we need to define. Because from the very start, when we proposed the project, yeah, the network partners were like, what is demodernizing? And we were like, well, this is part of the process to figure it out. So these were some of the key terms that we found kept returning in our conversations and we felt like we need to at least give a starting definition. So you can start the, you can find the definitions or the starting de um, definitions on the chat book as well as all the reflections from all of the network partners as well as the correspondence that I told you about that are kind of more like a witness account of what had happened or what we had talked about. And then also um, the annotated bi bibliography, which, as I said, was started by the CUNY students. But also, as we were talking with people from such different backgrounds, we found that there's such um, everybody had different re references to share. So all of the network partners added references that were important to bring in from their own contexts um, when thinking about demodernizing and institutional change. So yeah, please go enjoy, have fun. You'll see more of the. Uh, beautiful pictures that we had in our presentation, because we had also disposable cameras throughout the 
um, the whole three days in order to yeah have a more um, let's say cozy way of documenting the process. So that's the chapbook. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, that's tfd.kunstinstitutmeli.nl. If you go to the Meli website, that's very easy to find. It's like on the first page, you see like, like a picture that you can just click on. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Jesse and Julia. Uh, and once again, thank you to the Palais de Tokyo and to their team, and no less to the Terra Foundation that made possible the creation of the partnership and uh, the amazing experience of learning together as well as this event. Uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to Vivian to introduce the rest of the program. Vivian and Alexi, who's not here, who's an intern at the research and programs, uh, have been really working hard on making this online chat book available as of today. So thank you, Vivian, who will continue uh, talking about the rest of the program. And just a shout out to our deputy director and our development manager who also came to join us here in Paris. If they could just say like this so that we, yay, Sarah Van Overim and Paul Van Hennep. So I will pass on for uh, Vivian. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yulia, Jesse, and Sophia. Um, so the topic of the further conversation and the topic that framed uh, Grace's wonderful guided meditation that really brought us into the space was how might we retool institutional time? This was a question that emerged out of our gathering together in June that Yulia and Jesse have brought to life. And uh, as Sophia has mentioned, um, for us at Kunst Institute Melli, it's also a question that grew out of a three-year process of transformation uh, that began uh, with an event that was overseen by our former director, Defna Ayas, who's also here while we're doing shout-outs as well, and um, by which we divested from our former namesake, Vida De Witt, and moved to explore what we might become in its place. And we held open that question for quite a long time. Uh, change, of course, is inherently a problem of time. Uh, the how and the when are inseparable. Crisis produces a stuttering in time. Uh, and at the same instant, the symbolic and the structural must not be separated. Genuine foundational uh, reformation cannot be rushed. At least that's what we found. And amid these conflicting forces, time is encountered as plastic, as outside of its linearity, or any compliant notion of progress. Uh, deep and abiding transformation is by no means a straightforward process, and exactly that was what we learned from 2017 to 2021, and that we continue to explore through this process and with our partners. Uh, in this diagram, uh, which was contributed to the Tools for Collective Learning uh, publication that Sophia mentioned by the Rotterdam scholar Butaina Hamana, uh, she sought to convey the various competing pressures of history as they came to bear around our name change. Uh, I know the text is probably not available in the back, but maybe the form, the spread out and fragmented form is. Uh, within the diagram, she lists events that were pivotal to the name change from 2017 to 2021, both within the organization and its processes, outside of the organization and uh, social movements, anti-racist movements, uh, decolonizing movements, uh, but larger uh, academic uh, events within the academic community of the Netherlands and within its broader politics. Um, so this uh, diagram was one that we came to think with very closely through the name change. Also, as we came to understand that not only there was this diagram of the time of the change and the communities of Rotterdam and the Netherlands, there was also such a spread diagram for the 17th century in which the historical sea admiral Cornelis Wittesun de Witt had lived, uh, but also of the late 19th century, which was when our street and our building was established in the 1870s. And it was in the 1870s that the name of a former colonial figure was recuperated as one of the icons of a late modern nation. So in understanding what we were unnaming from, we were constantly being pulled, and for pulled back and forth through layers of history, as we were also understanding that our present was by no means organized in a linear way. 
So for this reason, we've uh, framed the question, how might we retool institutional time? Uh, the phrase, how might we, also came from our training sessions, in which we understood that the prefix, uh, how might we, uh, tended to lead towards collaborative um, processes of resolving new forms. So this question we've uh, thrown to some wonderful special guests that we're very honored to have with us. Uh, and I'm delighted now to then introduce um, Naomi Beckwith, who is the Deputy Director. I won't give the full title because it's one of these American very long titles, but who joins us from the Guggenheim. <laughs> uh, Elena Filipovich, who joins us from Basel, uh, current Director of the Kunsthalle Basel, as well as the artist Grace Indiritu, who's already given such a wonderful presentation. So Naomi and Elena will uh, give us some presentations and then we'll have a Q&A moderated by Natasha Petrosin Bechelez, who many in this room might know from the Cité International Des Arts. Thank you all for joining us from the bottom of our hearts. We appreciate it greatly. It works, it works. Good evening, everyone. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction, Vivian. Vivian, you basically set up all the terms for the way that I'm going to be speaking this evening. Time as plastic, imagining how not only institutions can change, but what it means to sort of follow thought and follow artists in imagining how institutions can change. But above all, thank you so much to the Institute Meli. Congratulations, Sophia, for pulling together a brilliant team, really giving us new ideas and new thoughts on how to reframe the institution. And thank you, of course, to the Palais Tokyo for hosting and having me this evening. Uh, just a word. I often give these talks a little bit improvisatory, kind of talk to the images, but I realize when we have to do translation, I torture uh, these poor sort of translators. So <laughs> I might be a little less engaging than usual, but I'm going to have to read tonight and be kind <laughs> to the translators. So with that, um, about 20 years ago, I asked a good friend, the scholar Huey G. Copeland, the following question. When did modernity begin? And Huey's rather pithy answer was 1492, right? So of course, 1492 is the famous year when Christopher Columbus sailed from Spain to what is soon to be called the New World. And what Copeland's answer cites is that modernity is built upon the encounter with an other, and then fortified by the subsequent creation of legal, economic, theological, and philosophical reasonings for the genocide of said others, the extraction of their resources, and eventually, the theft of millions of Africans to toil over those remaining resources. So, if modernity is, in fact, the birth of a rapacious, genocidal regime under which we continue to labor in the West, and if not globally, then no wonder we want to rid ourselves from this contamination. And if we clean house, ah, there we are, as Ariella Aisha Azule writes in her work on colonial violence and archival practices, then, we can begin a process of repair and restitution for all that theft and death. For Copeland and Azule, modernism is not so much a period in time, but a potent and pervasive set of perverse racial logics and fabricated hierarchies. Now, in my very simple education, modernity is chronological. It is, broadly speaking, a 19th century phenomenon, if I can never get the image to change. Ah, voila, <laughs> okay. It's a 19th century phenomenon, and art historian T.J. Clark has nominated Olympia as the quintessential modernist painting. However we may define it, modernism has been fruitful. Jumping across the Atlantic where I live, we see the term taken up in terms of newness in literature, art, and architecture in ways that extend for at least 100 years after modernism's supposed genesis in Western Europe. So I work here, and it's a temple of modernist art and architecture. 
So what, however one may define modernism, I'm complicit in it, right? <laughs> this is apparently my project. So the question is, what am I complicit in, right? Or rather, what am I trying to work against? And where do I find the tools to push against modernism suppositions, especially as someone who has been labeled in multiple ways and other? So one project that I work against that is, falls under the rubric of modernism is black erasure. For instance, T.J. Clark wrote 50 very erudite pages on Olympia as a painting that laid bare, quite literally, the encroachment of capital into the private sphere. Yet in all his writings, T.J. Clark doesn't mention the black woman in the painting. Right? And he doesn't, mention, he doesn't mention that this is a double portrait, not a single portrait. So he effectively erased the black woman in the image. Now, thanks to research by the historian uh, Denise Morel, we now know that the black woman in the painting was named Lore. And if I could ever get to it, I can show you that. Oh, you know what? Excuse me. Voila. <laughs> this is Lore. <laughs> um, but uh, Denise Morel also points out that she has to recuperate this woman's name 150 years after she's painted into this iconic work. So she's not only pointing out T.J. Clark's blind spots, but a whole series of historical erasures and the ways in which historically black subjects weren't allowed to be acknowledged as modern, even when they quite literally appeared in the frame of modernism. When posed the question on how to demodernize, I'm immediately reminded of the familiar trope of black diasporic people already existing outside of the realms of reason, logic, and even the framework of history. As Ikea Iman Jackson argues in her book, Becoming Human, we can easily trace a pseudoscientific and philosophical linkage between blackness and animality starting from the European Enlightenment till today. On the one hand, these pernicious ideas supported enslavement and its continued anti-black violence. On the other hand, it created a romanticized notion of blackness as close to nature. So as soon as modernism's arrival had even uh, announced itself in Europe, a backlash had already formed even in the 19th century, where anti-modernists were calling for a slowdown a return to medieval social structures. And they were looking to exotic Africans and indigenous Americans and even generic Orientals for models on how to return to a pure society. So black subjects tend to exist under modernism as a paradox. The subhuman that needs to be eradicated, yet somehow celebrated simultaneously as a noble savage. And both are forms of erasure. But I am most interested in the ways in which black diasporic subjects and thinkers have borrowed vocabulary and forms from modernism, yet supersede those very forms by remixing its legacies. How have black artists worked against their own erasure while also refusing to fully appear? For some conception of this, I turn to Afrofuturism a broad and very loosely defined set of visual and imaginative codes that have innovated mostly by black musicians in the States, but quickly spread to diasporic communities in Europe and in Africa. Again, there we are. The word Afrofuturism was first coined by the cultural critic Mark Dyer in 1994, and is most readily, rec readily recognized in Sun Ra's presentation and self-mythologizing as not a man born of this world, but as an alien from Saturn. And I was born and raised in Chicago, where Herman Poole Blunt became Sun Ra in the 1950s, and Ra's combination of the visual and the musical, the mythological and the technical, 
the scientific and the metaphysical left a massive impression on the art and music scenes. And these are the scenes that I would encounter in my formative years. And we see plenty of other musicians following in Sun Ra's example, like George Clinton and the Parliament Funkadelic, which blended many visual codes pointing to Africanity, Egyptology, the occult, carnival, and space travel. And these legacies become a model for the ways in which I approach cultural history. So clearly the term Afrofuturism owes the debt to Italian futurism, but the genre really isn't, it's not an, uh, an offshoot of modernism. It's really the invention of a black neo-avant-garde. Afrofuturist aesthetics remove black people out of the surreality of history, out of historic and structural racism, and places them into speculative realms that collapse time, planets, and even media um, of visual arts and the performing arts. As the Art Ensemble of Chicago said about their musics and their paintings, we are ancient to the future. I and my fellow art historians who write on Afrofuturism follow that sense of temporal disruption and multidisciplinary practices. For instance, in the Shadows Took Shape exhibition co-curated by Naima Keith and Zoe Whitley's, the curators argue that the roots of Afrofuturism go way back beyond Sun Ra toward the 19th century. That moment when capitalism created an industrial scaled, which is to say modernist, enterprise of enslaving black Africans for transport to the Americas. In Keith and Whitley's summation, Afrofuturism is born from mass death in the Middle Passage. Black communities had to create speculative narratives and alternative realities to rationalize and maybe even redeem all that death. Saidia Hartman writes about the need for other stories because for the Afro-Atlantic subject, to be within linear history is to be traumatized. To quote Hartman, was it why I sometimes felt weary of America, as if I too had landed in what was now South Carolina in, in 1526, or Jamestown in 1619? Was it the tug of all those lost mothers and orphan children? Or was it that each generation felt anew the yoke of a damaged life? and the distress of being a native stranger, an eternal alien. So, if one has a sense of being an eternal alien, then why not make it productive and self-present as an otherling, whose past and futurity are enmeshed in a recursive tangle rather than following a linear line? But Ramosi, as I was saying, describes himself as a 14th century monk in a manner that exemplifies an Afrofuturist tendency to bend time toward the past and the future. Musicians, next slide please, are the best known Afrofuturists. But the line between music and visual arts for many black creatives has always been porous. Many black artists such as Charles Gaines or Sanford Biggers were trained as musicians before they even took up the fine arts. And we find musicians of the Art Ensemble of Chicago, for instance, that I showed you early, making paintings, while visual artists such as Terry Atkins, next slide please, <laughs> compose musical works drawn mostly from improvised gestures. Afrofuturist themes are particularly fruitful for filmmakers, especially those in the sci-fi genre, who create alternative worlds in narrative films. But there are also filmmakers who use otherworldly characters to scramble our pre-written histories, offering a new perspective, or who may bring salvation to our dying earth. And there are those characters who may be the first to escape the horrors of this world. Then there are times when Afrofuturism appears in a high, almost arch-modernist form, mining the archive of black portraiture to remix collage, montage, and assemblage. 
Collage is the quintessential media of disordered forms, disrupted logics, non-linearity, and flattened hierarchies. And just as montage plays with the logic of time and linearity, so may an Afrofuturist draw upon montage's visual forms, but will combine that with black music's improvisatory traditions to create experiments in multiplicity and non-linearity. Finally, Afrofuturism can throw a glitch into the contemporary technological encroachments into our private lives, as demonstrated by, in the filmic essays by the Altolith Group. According to Koju Eshun, who is one of the founders of the Altolith Group and probably one of the greatest philosophers of Afrofuturism, one must be wary of, quote, chronopolitical instruments designed to envision, manage, and deliver futures. Now, Ashun was speaking of capitalism, but I think he could have been speaking of modernism itself with its prescriptions for evolution and linear progress. Thus, an Afrofuturist modality could be about acquiring an acuity of vision and gaining the clarity to look beyond this world's formation and imagine other possibilities. Personally, I borrow heavily from the ideas of the Black avant-garde, which have shaped my professional life. My museum work is guided by their principles, their principles of experimentation, collective practices, and honoring the intelligence that resides within black life. Afrofuturism is less concerned with futurity per se, but more with the ability to speak from a presentness that encapsulates the past and sees the future all at once. And Grace, I thank you for that guided meditation, which was literally about centering us in the present, but imagining several generations in the future. It can reside outside of history and out of this world. But if we are to be of this world, then the future is the register that holds so much promise. As Franz Fanon states in his introduction to black skin, white mass, the future is, quote, linked to the present insofar as I consider the present something to be overtaken. And that is my reason for living. Thank you. I'm happy to be the slide person for whoever speaks next, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi, for that. Um, I've now, I have several tough acts to follow. And thank you for this incredible invitation to be part of, um, of such a gathering um, to all those involved, to Vivian, to Sophia, to the Palais Tokyo, to the Terra Foundation. It's an honor to be among you. Um, in thinking about this invitation, I, um, I knew that I would follow Naomi with this sweeping art historical um, breadth um, into past, present, and future. And so I thought maybe, um, maybe as a proper response, I would go into a case study of one particular example, one particular exhibition or set of exhibitions that allowed me, um, at a time that I was just beginning uh, at my first institutional job, to think about how an institution, how an exhibition, how a curator might allow uh, a body of work itself to determine the time, the form, the format of its own viewing. That artist is Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, whose retrospective I had the honor to organize uh, starting in 2009. It was my first task that I was given as a newbie curator, just starting at an institution my, my, much like those we've spoken about today, um, a kind of Kunsthalle type institution, which is Wheels Center for Contemporary Art in Brussels. The, um, the date for the exhibition was already planned um, even before I arrived as a new curator. The task my di director had given me, organize a retrospective. Um, I was honored 
Um, uh, <laughs> um, I knew Felix's work, as many of us might know his work. Um, the candies, the endless piles of candies, individually wrapped um, with their various titles insinuating their political dimension. Uh, the paper stacks, also present as objects without a pedestal to be taken, to be touched, um, whose life exceeds the realm of the museum. Oh, sorry. Um, and clocks. I'd read all of the descriptions of the clocks that we read over and over again in the descriptions of Felix Gonzalez Torres's work. Two industrially made clocks, mostly from China, uh, placed one next to another, their batteries inserted at the beginning of an exhibition, and left and set at the same time, and allowed to run um, throughout the duration of the exhibition without anything being touched or changed. Inevitably, they fall out of step. One might die before the other, much like Perfect Lovers, um, where mortality again and again is inscribed in Felix's work as something to be um, wary of, celebrated, announced, known, felt. These were the works I knew. Um, these were the works that had inspired me as a curator. But as I started to investigate them and started to read over and over again that line, Felix Gonzalez Torres, most influential artist of his generation, I wondered how this Cuban artist, born in 1957, who died of AIDS-related complications in 1996, what influence had he had exactly? Artists, after all, who came after him were not putting clocks together, building piles of candy or paper. Where was the influence of his work? And of course, as an activist artist, as a political artist, as one who decided in his creation of objects that the politics should not be on the surface of how artworks looked, or even what their titles were, but in their, in their structural opera, operational value, in what they did and what they made us do. When I read interviews with the artist, when I read lectures that he'd given, and I realized that again and again, Felix had told students um, when he was teaching at art school, um, the very first task he would give them was to go home and come back the next day with an article from the New York Times that they could show was filled with lies. It was long before fake news. Um, and as a photography professor, this was the task that he gave his students, to make criticality, to make the questioning of authority the very center of how you think and begin to become an artist. Uh, in lectures, he would speak about the dictionary as a piece of literature, not a tool, but a piece of literature written by someone at a certain moment, at a certain time, of a certain race, a certain gender. Um, he made, in everything he did, us realize that authority, which is to say modernity, um, because what is modernity but the authority of uh, a certain definition of hegemonic values, of hegemonic time, a certain notion of linearity, that all of these things needed to be questioned. In interviews, he talked about he didn't want to become a religion, a father, an authority, a, a giver of truths, that everything he'd done in his life was about dismantling them. And so I went back to this director, um, Dirk Snauert, actually brilliant, um, inspiring mentor and newbie curator that I was, I went back to him and said, I am so honored you've entrusted me to organize this retrospective, but we shouldn't do it. If I've understood anything about Felix Gonzalez Torres is that all of his life work was about undermining authority. And what would a retrospective be if not an authoritative form? A curator's decision about which 40 works, in which order, in which chronology, in which thematic grouping declares itself as the, the singular vision of an artist. And yet everything about what Felix did undermined this. If any of you have seen a portrait that Felix has, has made, 
um, a portrait of a person. He's also made portraits of institutions. They are running texts that run along the frieze. I don't think I brought a photo. Um, uh, the frieze uh, of a building. They have dates and important events, but he specifically created these so that they could be undone, reformulated, remade across the life of a person and even in their afterlife. He made a portrait of himself that could be changed and gives the responsibility to any curator that works with them, to any owner that might buy them, to any institution that might be the custodian of them, that they can and should change this portrait according to their ideas about what this person lived through is, what the world is at any given moment. All of these things convinced me that a retrospective was the wrong idea. And my director, um, he nodded his head, as any director should, and he said, this sounds very interesting and very important. I, I gave a long explanation about why one shouldn't do a retrospective. And he said, I understand you, but you will do it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I went back to the drawing board, and I read all the interviews again, and I did it all over again, all the reasoning uh, to understand how one could make a retrospective. And I thought, one cannot make a retrospective that wouldn't be authoritative, that wouldn't in some way dishonor the very essence of what made this artist so powerfully important and influential. And I went back again to my director, and, I, and, and again, he did the nodding, and he said, yes, but you will do it. You will find a way. And, and so I did what, what anyone can do in such a situation. I went to talk to artists. I wanted to understand how Felix had been and why he'd been so influential to them. And I understood as I met them that my Felix Gonzalez Torres, that, that one that I'd formed in my imaginary through reading, through looking, was not their Felix Gonzalez Torres. And each of us had different ideas about what made this artist influential and important and what an undermining of authority truly is. As a final conclusion to a rather long back and forth with my director, I finally um, thought, okay, the only way to do this retrospective would be to make one that itself would have no authority, that itself would undermine uh, the idea of a singular narrative, a singular way of showing the work. Because if I'd learned anything by looking at these works, is that Felix had understood that the authority that needed to be dismantled was not just that of the artist, because in essence, if as an artist you build a pile of candies and allow a public to touch and take and move, um, the form is completely determined by the aleatory qualities um, that the authority of the author as the final form giver is undone. But also the authority of the institution, because if you can touch and if you can take, um, if you can eat, if you can throw your you know, bonbon uh, wrapper away, everything about the way an institution typically operates is undone. Their authority questioned. And, and so what would it mean to make an exhibition with no authority? Um, as I mentioned, I started talking to artists and I'm going to run you through, as a rather breathless pace, six versions of this Felix Gonzalez Torres retrospective. Because I understood not one could possibly reveal the, the, both this questioning of authority but also the mutability, the questioning of time, the questioning of form at the heart of what Felix did. In preparing for that exhibition, I looked to the catalogue raisonné. It happens there is one. And in this catalogue raisonné, you see one image. It might have been any of those that I showed you for every one of the artworks, one image. But in fact, if you would read the contracts that accompany every single work, um, if you read their descriptions, you would understand that a work like this one has an endless number of copies, that it's eight inches at an ideal height. What is ideal? Who's ideal? Felix had embedded into his very labels, into his very understanding of the work, the idea that the responsibility would always be for its caregivers. And so this mutability and this change needed to be shown as well. Because if the catalogue raisonné showed a, uh, a paper stack at eight inches high, what would happen when someone else's ideal were different? Um, 
At what point do you show the candy pile? At the beginning, when it's perfectly made, when it's moved and changed, or in another form that it's been given by the curator, given responsibility to, to interpret it differently? And so I decided I would make a version of the retrospective. I felt a certain responsibility as an art historian to have a certain number of iconic works, and here's the a kind of you know, I'm walking you through some of the images of the show. And already I'm showing you now version two. At every one of the venues where the exhibition was held, this first one at Wheels in Brussels, I decided that I would install a version of a retrospective and halfway through its duration, the show would come down and a young artist who had been influenced by Felix's work but had not met the artist, would be allowed to take down my show and reinstall their own version of a Felix Gonzalez Torres retrospective. Potentially a completely different checklist, um, completely different mise en scène. This one by Yan Vo. One thing you might notice, um, you won't get a sense of it, I reduced my images to a minimum, but if in my, work, in my version of the retrospective at Wheels, I had about 50 artworks by Felix. In Jan Vo's version, there was 18 in the very same spaces. So it was a radically reduced version. Um, labels. Jan Vo proposed brass labels engraved as he is wont to do with his own shows, with a floor plan and all the information about the works. And I remember endless discussions with Jan about, well, is this a work by Jan Vo or is this a label? And he said very clearly, it's a label. And I said, yeah, but it's brass and it's engraved. And, um, and I realized in the discussion that his choice simply made apparent how the supposed neutrality of mine was not neutral at all. Helvetica, 12-point font on a white museum label, why should that be any less acceptable or more acceptable than brass engraved? Um, Yan made certain important decisions in the exhibition, often taking down a part of what I'd done to show the very same work in an utterly different fashion. But one of the sort of most striking, most memorable, and most difficult um, works that, or decisions that he made as curator, was to um, interpret Felix's notion that, in, that the audience might well be an audience of one, might be, um, in this case, an audience of the head technician of Wheels, who had helped to produce um, the very works in the exhibition. Yan Vo decided that the only outdoor light spring, light string that Felix had made would be shown, but it would be installed just outside the window of the head technician who lived about one hour outside of um, Brussels. And so there was you know, rampant discussion at the institution about what is a public institution doing installing a light string work one hour outside on a, you know, on a public street, but um, to a community of unknown visitors and um, its electricity had to be pulled from the house itself, which meant that the technician who was given the incredible gift of having this light string hung so that it would be ideally viewed from his bed window um, would have to make the choice of whether or not to have the heater on and the oven and the lights or a heater, the lights, and a hair dryer, and that would blow the fuse. And so everything about this technician's life also changed for the duration of the exhibition in, able, in order to accept that gift. The exhibition traveled. Again, I reinstalled a different version of a Felix Gonzalez Torres retrospective, this one at the Fondation Baylor in Basel. Here, you get a glimpse of an exhibition curated um, by me, a different one from the one at Wheels, inserted into the permanent collection of the exhibition. The second artist um, that I invited to engage with the show, in other words, to take down my version of the Felix Gonzalez Torres retrospective, um, and here's just some highlights of how I interspersed and the relationships I constructed between iconic, modernist um, works within the collection 
and Felix's own work. Um, I invited Carol Bove to, again, take down my show, reinstall her own version. She made a very important decision that she would not change the checklist, that in her version of the exhibition, she would show all the same works that I did in all the same spaces, but that her ideals or her average height or width or weight would be different, showing this very important element in Felix's thinking about the work. But she did made an important other decision. While on the surface, you might not notice a difference between this photo and the one that I showed you, in her case, she decided to move herself and her family for the whole duration of the exhibition to take care of it. She understood that Felix, if he taught us anything, he taught us that care was necessary in institutions and in relation to art. These um, curtains actually stretch and every two or three days need to be carefully trimmed. And she decided she would be the one to do it. She also, you know, refilled the paper stacks, refilled the candy piles, um, and used the downstairs space of the exhibition to do something quite remarkable. In the back rooms, the one you might see through that passageway, she installed a reconstruction of a show that had lasted only one month um, during Felix's lifetime, his first gallery show at Andrea Rosen, which was called Every Week There's Something Different. And this was a show that had inspired me in thinking about my own version of the retrospective and all the conversations with artists. It was the thing that gave me liberty to imagine such a show at all. Um, every week, artworks were changed and swapped throughout the exhibition. Carol simulated that but she decided in the space before it to show the crates, the, um, the crates, the boxes, um, to ask the question. We know that when a, when a work of Picasso is taken down and put in storage, that it's still inevitably a work of Picasso. But is a box of candies still a Felix Gonzalez Torres when it isn't on display, when it isn't operating? I take you to the very last version of the exhibition. Um, the MMK um, in Frankfurt was where, again, I reinstalled a yet again different version um, of the retrospective. And here I'm just walking you through how differently the works looked, how they occupied their space. Um, and Tino Segal was the last of the artists that I invited to take down my show and reinstall it differently. Tino's radical proposal was to construct not one new version of the retrospective, but another six. So if the show was a multiplication of six, he'd made it yet again another six. The difference was, in his duration of the exhibition, he had two, in this case, two trained artists from the Städelschule consistently installing and reinstalling and moving the show room from room throughout the duration. So at any given moment as a visitor, this is what you might see. And visitors would come in, buy their ticket, and then walk out thinking they'd walked into the installation of the show. But actually, constantly this was happening as from one room to the next, one version of the show was being deinstalled and changed into another. And it was you might say a perfect Felix, a perfect Felix Gonzalez Torres sort of interpretation, but also a Tino Segal work. Um, but if you know Tino Segal's work, you know that you can't possibly show photos of Tino's work. And in this case, he understood that this absolutely is a retrospective of Felix Gonzalez Torres and not um, a Tino Segal performance. And yet it was ongoing, it was mutable, it was changing, it understood how time, how, um, how interpretation, how responsibility functions. Um, and here I'm showing you the same room again and again with different variations of, um, of Felix's work installed. At the very end of the exhibition, once I'd gone through six iterations, three incredible thinkers thinking with me alongside what it meant to, to properly honor the work and practice of an artist. I was with the team to take down these clocks, these clocks that had stood for me for the mortality, the love, everything that Felix, I had always been told, represented. And I remember getting to these clocks and then 
kind of looking at my own because I wanted to figure out there had been a whole um, five minutes that had elapsed in time between them because we hadn't changed the batteries for the whole duration of these six iterations. And suddenly I, I caught myself checking my watch to see what, what time was it really? Was it 4.55 or was it five already? And my, my watch had a third option. And I realized in that moment that this very work encapsulated what the whole show had done, which is to say, to put us in front of something for which we had no idea, which was the authoritative version, which told us the correct time, which told us the correct way. We wouldn't know. All of these shows together, maybe, were an attempt to honor the incredible activist, political, social, and intellectual prowess of this legend who would be 66 now um, and we forget how, um, how young he died and what a big mark he left. And so if our institutions are to demodernize, if they are to think differently, I know for myself the only way that I could imagine doing it was to look to artists themselves, to remember that the eye and the mind, they are muscles and curating is too. And um, as Grace so beautifully told us, if we want to change things, we might not look for tools outside of ourselves, but tools within ourselves, and tools around us at the inspiration of artists for how we might rethink our institutions and our very thinking about what institutions can do and how to do them. Thank you. Thank you to Vivian and to the team of Kunst Institute Meli for inviting me to moderate the unmoderatable <laughs> um, in time and in space of Palais de Tokyo um, that has been uh, really inspiring us a lot uh, in the last um, year and years. Um, so I'm Natasha Petrishin Bachelez and I'm very happy to be contributing to this space of parents since um, 2005 when I moved here from Slovenia. I am head of uh, artistic program in Cité Internationale des Arts where the, one of the key values is conviviality uh, since it's a residency place. But I also happened to have been thinking about uh, slowing down since quite some time uh, in my writings, so in 2016, 2017, I, I published an essay that was um, actually thinking through Isabel Stengers about the um, when when her colleague got arrested uh, or not arrested, sorry, strong word, where her colleague got um, um, uh, fired from the university in uh, Belgium. Uh, for having de uh, demonstrated against the um, uh, GMO, um, so modified uh, seeds, uh, and she was fired because she was claimed to be uh, subjective instead of an objective scientist who works and teaches uh, students. So that's where Isabel Stenger stood up and wrote a beautiful text called A Plea for Slow Research. And I thought, what would it be? A plea for slow institutions. And that's well, how my text came about. And um, listening to all this um, uh, beautiful, um, very grounded um, first meditation and knowing your work, Grace, since a long time and having had the chance to, to listen to you way back in the, well, 2011 already, um, Elena, with whom I shared many, many years also of, of a lot of... Uh, um, yeah, a lot of discussions. Um, we have had the pleasure of listening to Felix, but it's so, I mean, uh, of you speaking about this in Paris uh, to our seminar, but it's so beautiful to rewind the time and look through it from where you are today, uh, because it feels, again, um, listening to you, it feels how you again thought of it from where you are today speaking from. Uh, and Naomi, uh, for the first um, mind-blowing and, and also again ground, grounding and humbling uh, um, for us white uh, um, or passing as white people um, who 
feel um, that actually not only that uh, we have produced uh, or, or the civilization, let's say, from uh, from the colonial uh, times onwards have produced this uh, dehumanizing process, but also maybe the first question would be in relationship to the tools of demodernizing. Um, what is, in the words of the poet and uh, a dear friend of mine and of many of us here, Olivier Marboeuf, uh, he questioned actually what is the rehumanization process? What is the, um, the human that we want together to refer to after this incredibly um, you know, genocidal violence that we are facing yet again today? Uh, and have been in uh, many of this, uh, many of the humans that belong to the same civilization have been facing for centuries. So um, he, of course, talks about rehumanization through Sylvia Winter uh, and Alexander Weheli and uh, several of also um, through Francoise Vergès' work. Um, the question is really about. Uh, where are we demodernizing to, right? And, and this is indeed when the time becomes an important tool in the institutions, in the artistic work, in enabling that the artistic processes take time. Because with time there is trust, with trust among teams to develop. We have experienced this beautiful presentation that felt so consolidated and lived through when listening to you. So that enables uh, something where, when an institution says, how do we slow down? How do we not overproduce? And how do we not over broadcast, but rather share, support, take care? Um, so I'm sorry for this long introduction. I have over, over, obviously been overwhelmed by what, I, by what I've heard. Um, but maybe starting back to, to how we started this, um, uh, this lovely evening <laughs> chat. Um, Grace, you have been uh, quite instrumental uh, in the last years uh, through your approach to museums and thinking about, from your perspective, how the healing processes can uh, be enacted. Um, and it is a certain kind of spiritual activism. Uh, it's a horrible word, I know, I'm <laughs> sorry. But how, what, what did the, how did it take you from where you started with? Uh, mm -hmm. And for example, until today, when you did it here with Palais de Tokyo, what have you learned? How do you actually, uh, how do you gather uh, the impressions, let's say? Okay, so, yeah, you're referring to my project, Healing the Museum, which I started in 2012. And this was because I was very frustrated with museums. I felt they were dying. I felt they didn't really reflect the real social, political landscape back in 2012. Um, and so I just felt there needed to be new energies brought into the museum, and this would attract new publics and new ways of thinking. And yes, time was part of that, this idea of slowing down. So I came up with this concept of introducing non-rational methodologies through using shamanism and meditation and working with all types of audiences, um, usually rational people <laughs> who would think they were rational, but I would take them on shamanic journeys. Uh, but they were always for political reasons. Um, and a way of being a way of trying to find new answers um, to being in an institution. Because for me, um, I see healing as a form of institutional critique, which means that you're not only just talking about healing with the public, you're talking about the objects, you're also talking about the staff. So most recently, um, in the last year, I was the artist of residence at SMAC in Ghent, um, where I was given a staff membership badge and I could go to all the different departments. Um, I followed the cleaning team, the security team, the business, the collections. Um, and the collections are spread over three different sites inside the building, at the port, and also, uh, funny enough, under the football stadium. 
they have a collection, <laughs> yes. Um, so I worked with these different, all different departments, and I also interviewed 40 out of the 50 uh, members of staff. So it was a very therapeutic um, residency, and I built a lot of trust with the staff, and I interviewed them, and I asked them questions about not only the jobs and their roles in the museum, uh, their daily routines, about their personal lives, but also about their spiritual practice. Did they understand spiritual practice? What did it mean to them personally? And this was all in the context of being asked to do the residency because SMAC is going to build a new museum in 2030. And this is the point and where they're just about to, was just about to launch the architectural competition. So for me, uh, even before thinking about what kind of building you're going to build, you should be thinking about the energy of the building, you know, what the staff need. And so it was really good to, you know, the staff would tell me confidential things, you know, and some things um, I would keep obviously privately, but then some things I would also relay to the director, Philip Van Kouten, who was very close to, and Anne Host. And uh, at the same time, I was working on doing a mid-career survey show and a book. But what was really interesting, out of all this kind of research, um, I've decided to, instead of do something uh, like a show, for example, you couldn't really see what I was doing behind the scenes in my um, survey show, but I've decided I'm going to write a book, a kind of novel that talks about these things, because I do feel like it's the general public now that need to understand the changes that are going on inside the museum sector, you know, especially because issues like restitution have become much more mainstream. And um, yeah, and why museums are striking and all these issues about wages and, you know, these complex issues is the general public now that need to understand um, the landscape. And I feel like that is the only way uh, in terms of you asked me how Healing the Museum has been going. So in these 10 years, yes, it's gone from being a very obscure thing of talking about healing and no one understanding what I was going on about to now healing is a mainstream word and term being used in museums. So I'm very pleased to have contributed to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Naomi, I would be very um, interested also to hear from you uh, how does this, um, how do you bring where you work actually in this context when you were describing it as a complicity, right? I mean, and we all feel very closely related to that word, of course, and to that state of being. Um, and I, I, listening to Grace, I reminded myself of this beautiful symposium that Vivian co curated. It was called Humans of the Institution, Humans of the Institutions. Um, indeed, so how, how within a structure that has this um, modernist legacy, um, such as Guggenheim, so where do you see the, the potential for, for this um, um, undoing, let's say, or, or making visible the, that complicity? Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's so many things. That's, <laughs> that's a long answer, but I think I would start with one thing that you already said. A, it will take a lot of time. And I think even when I arrived at the institution, I was incredibly, obviously, ambitious about certain changes that could happen. But then I realized that breaking habits, breaking teams, breaking understandings of what it means to work and practice, those things are psychological effects. And those things really are um, uh, practices that take deep internal work. So Grace, I hear you on this being a metaphysical and spiritual practice and even a psychoanalytic one. So it's one in which I have to sit through with the team and deal with them as humans. And the first step I would say has been what my team keeps calling you're decentering the curatorial department, right? This we work in a very traditional museum where the curators have nominally set at the top of every program, every practice, every project, and kind of dictated terms. But I told them, look, if we are an artist and art object-centered institution, then the curat curatorial team will always be central. But what I'm trying to do is de-apex. Get rid of those hierarchies, 
right, by which your word is the only word that's valid in the ways in which we imagine how art can be presented to our public. There are plenty of other people, 300 other people inside the institution who can help with that practice. So that's been step one. I think the ultimate goal is getting to what you got at, Elena, which is the question of how do you allow for fluidity in the presentation of your work when your entire reputation is based on authority, right? If the Guggenheim were to publish tomorrow a press release saying that everything we said is up for debate, I think there would be a mass suicide, literally, you know, in the institution. So getting them to that sense of other possibilities is that slow kind of psychological, almost, as I said, psychoanalytic work that has to happen on a human scale. And then lastly, I mean, thank you for also uh, bringing up this point, uh, Natasha, about imagining, again, what complicity means um, you know, and what it means to be human in this institution, and what it means to come through a legacy of colonialism. Because in many ways, I mean, with all due respect to the topics, uh, to the topic and the convening, I don't know if there's a such thing as totally demodernizing, mm. right? I think there are ways in which you can break with habits, break with tradition, acknowledge a toxic past, but modernism becomes that thing that sits in your gut floor, right? It is in your DNA. Right? But what you have to do is sort of recombine that DNA and that genealogy with something else that then allows for an opening up and a flowering. And for me, as I say, it's, it's black studies and black studies not just being something for black people, but as another tool that we can access to rethink all those modalities of authority that we've just presumed as correct. Thank you so much. Elena, um Listening to you and knowing your work since many years, um, it's always beautiful to see how, how the, through your still author authorial position that you, we have to occupy as curators, however, you bring really uh, back into the center, let's say, artistic visions and, and artists and their um, knowledges. Uh, and what it means to have, um, what, it, what it is actually that the artists produce when they research, what, the, what is that knowledge, right, that arises and that is still not completely the same as social sciences knowledge or etc. But we know today, I'm, so I'm referring back to um, Guillaume Desange who was mentioning that, you know, the Palais de Tokyo is undergoing um, this, um, uh, larger institutional rethinking uh, through the concept of permaculture and uh, we know this means years of work because permaculture takes time and has to take time in order to see the fruits uh, and reading um, Masao Fukuoka who was the founder of permaculture he says it beautifully and that's where I refer to Elena he says for example when you when you're starting to talk about whether or not use um, organic um, uh, fertilizers on the fields, etc., and when you see for years that, for example, spiders build webs, they shine in the, in the sun, the, the rain will fall, etc., he goes on and on and he says, it, it occurs to you that it's not only scientists that should talk about this question, it's not only um, farmers that should call, talk about this question. You have to bring in poets, you have to bring in artists. And I believe that, again, going back to the meditation, and to you, Elena, the, the artists do have, and not in this romantic way, but almost in a survival survivalist way, have the potential to open and share and um, let us taste and, and envision what could be another future. And with your retrospective of Felix's work, it was, it was contemporary, it was not a, it was not a, a retrospective, it was contemporary perspective. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, um, uh, so yeah, so in, within your position as well as, as a museum director, or well, you're still at Kunsthalle, but future museum director, how do you, through meditation, how do you envision 
uh, that that future uh, uh, position of the artists, where would you like to see it? Th thank you for that question. Hello? I may have turned it off. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, it has been a kind of through line in in, in my practice to try to understand not just an artist's work as a, as a set of things um, or a museum as a cemetery for those dead things, but artist's work as a practice, as a logic, as an operational tool that might inspire us as institutional animals that we are to, to follow them. And although I can stand now with the distance of, of several years on that project, um, actually 13 years on that project, I should maybe tell one story which is indicative of you know, how that project was received. You know, on the one hand, when I would talk about it to colleagues, to friends, to other artists, there was an enormous enthusiasm about this rethinking of what a retrospective could be and what it could do and what voice in which it could speak. Um, and yet, at, on the first day of the opening, after Jan Vo's version of the retrospective opened, there was this group of um, sort of elderly women that came to Wheels um, clutching the you know, first rave reviews that had appeared in a Belgian newspaper showing this golden curtain that traversed the main space. They bought their tickets, they went into the exhibition, and they didn't find the golden curtain. And they didn't find any of the works described in the review of the exhibition. And they came down and they asked for their money back. And because they said, well, you know, this is, this is an installation of, of it's half finished, it's, it's not the show we've come to see. And so I realized however much as an institutional sort of employee, as a curator, one might think you need to rethink conventions, might break apart traditional logics. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> been crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. As much as we may think this is necessary and needs to be done, in that very moment I realized we also need an, art, uh, an audience to follow us in this. They need to fully be part of the discussion of understanding what it is we're doing and why it might be relevant and important to do. And in that moment I realized, okay, more mediation is needed. More discussion is needed so that when the press does talk about the project, they don't hold my version as the, authorita the de facto authoritative version. And throughout you know, the run of the exhibition, again and again, we needed at every step of the way to think about the tickets. For instance, not, you would have to be able to visit all six versions of the retrospective with the purchase of one ticket at any one of the locations, which you know, meant institutions need to needed to negotiate with one another. You needed to be able to visit each institution twice to see the two versions. And so everything about the conventions attached to exhibition making, from ticketing to mediation to you know, communication to ticketing, needed to be changed as well. So I would say that um, this doesn't make the task impossible, but for all of us that are thinking about wanting to use tools to change our institutions, I think we need a grace, <laughs> and we need, we need, um, and we need grace. We need to, you know, we need to also allow the feedback that comes from the public to also reform our institutions and change them from within as well. I mean, I have to say, Natasha, if I can just follow up on that with a point that you made about um, one of your institutional values being conviviality. It's the same at the, uh, the uh, Kunstinstitut Meli. Conviviality is a value that goes outward, right? And I just realized, I took a note about this, that the values that we talk about from my institution are inward facing, how we work with each other. But we never ask that question. How do we actually appear and invite feedback from those externally. So I do think those little shifts and sort of asking, you know, who's missing in all of these um, kind of discourses and conversations, exactly, is deeply important. 
Um, yeah, uh, just in relation to what you both were just saying. Uh, for me, um, I could tell you some examples. So I've been doing this performance uh, for the last three years called Labour, Birth of a New Museum, so where I work with pregnant women. And I invite them to come into the museum and I take them on a shamanic journey. Uh, and it's to connect with the unborn child so, and to find the soul name of the unborn child. And so I'm very interested in this idea of the unborn art audience. So when the mothers have this really powerful experience, you know, they go on the shamanic journey, they connect with their own child, they also connect with each other, and there's a collective moment um, in, in the journey, but also afterwards when we're sharing stories. Um, what's really powerful about this is they always come back after they've given birth. So they give birth to their child and they bring back their child to the museum. And they tell the child, I had this amazing experience here. This is where we met. And so I've been really happy to do this um, performance. I did it in Nottingham Contemporary and in Ram Exeter and Smack uh, in Ghent. And uh, for me, this is the next step of my ideas. It's about the generations. And that's what I was trying to do in the guided meditation um, at, at the beginning. So, so, sorry to jump in again, but yeah. I have this dream of a Lorna Simpson retrospective happening at the Guggenheim. It just should happen, just putting it out there. If you see any of my curators, just let them know I said that. <laughs> Though I've said it to them already, so just reiterate it for me. Um, but I only want to do it, I mean, actually, I wouldn't say only, but one of the driving factors is um, when I was working on Lorna's last catalog, I found a picture of her mother at the Guggenheim pregnant with Lorna. And I asked that to be added to the Guggenheim's photo archives, right? To think about literally that potential future that was already with her mother at that moment. Wow. <laughs> so, can you hear me? No. So that brings me to... Um, uh, I'll jump into a question about uh, transnational feminism because actually I haven't heard that concept from you while you are actually doing it so clearly. So I wanted to, to bring that also as a, as a really important um, set of knowledges that was given to us all, uh, albeit the gender or whatever the gender we, we adhere to. Um, and talking about the pregnant uh, women. So I, I, at the moment at CT, there is an exhibition that I curated with Nicole Fernandez Ferrer. Some of you have uh, visited it. Uh, and um, it's about uh, the legacy of 70s and 80s feminism in France through the videos that were not meant to be for the art context, but have been created by somebody as known as Delphine Seric, who was an actress. Uh, and has worked together with Carol Rousopoulos and Joanna Vider. Uh, and, and they are put in dialogue with several feminist um, artists that have been to CTA in the last years, such as Leonor Antunes, Zanele Moholi, Bushra Khalili, and uh, Miriam Mihindu, many, many of them uh, very renowned uh, feminist positions. And the title that we chose comes from a photo where there is a pregnant Carole Rousopoulos. Carole was the first woman in France to own a Sony Portapac video camera that was bought thanks to her friend Jean Genet, who told her, if you buy this video camera, you will be a free woman. And so after Godard and Marker, who made amazing films, but they were two men, <laughs> To say it bluntly, uh, Carole came and started immediately to teach other women how to use the video. And this is how these collectives were, were born, and the, the exhibition is also about that. And on that photo, in the exhibition, the one of the first we see is she is pregnant with a camera in her hand, and her husband is in the back, uh, having over the shoulder the magnetoscope. So supporting and caring for what is being taken. So. I wanted also to, to bring this to, to ask what role um, consciously or unconsciously had um, certain transnational feminist authors or artists for you, if you could just maybe acknowledge, let's say, together, what, what was it your mothers, was it your, right? I mean, it's important, I would say, 
uh, especially after hearing so many wonderful um, presentations coming from um, women today. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, definitely my mother, my own mother, because she was an activist, um, and her and her friends, my mother's from Kenya, uh, her and her friends set up a group called Women in the Third World, and they would have film screenings, they would do anti-apartheid marches. This is the household I grew up with. And then, actually, when I was 10, she went to... She was a nurse, but then she went to train a truth and reconciliation studies. So this whole thing about healing, I really think it comes from that, you know, of being in that atmosphere of, like, being with somebody who understood nonviolent communication and all of that from such a young age. And then other women, I was talking about Joanna Macy. She's an ecological activist who's amazing. Uh, from the 60s, 70s, and everyone from, you could say, let's say, Anna Mendetta, Marina Abramovic, but also um, women that I've met, like Marianne Williamson, she's like amazing woman, um, yeah, all sorts of women. Thank you. Um, sure, uh, I'm certainly, I, I am here um, in Paris, or I am where I am, um, thanks to uh, the women that came before me, um, and most directly or particularly uh, my own mother. So I was raised by a single Hispanic mother um, who you know, took on a third job um, after I apparently bothered her to no end on the e uh, just after a school trip that had brought me for the first time into a museum where for me that most magical place of storytelling of potential was, was revealed as being so different from my very modest upbringing that museums became this, this kind of place I looked to and wanted to go to. So she took on a third job to save up money so that she could bring her six-year-old daughter to Paris for the first time. Um, because she understood that that was where culture was. And, um, and so Paris was the first, um, and the Louvre was kind of the, you know, the first museum whose you know, memory I have ingrained in me, um, in my retina forever after, as if it were yesterday. And so I'm convinced that my endless returns to Paris have been always simply trying to recreate um, that magic um, and that moment, and my, certainly my commitment to artists and art and museums um, as I stand poised to, um, to take on a museum, um, the directorship of a museum, the Kunstmuseum Basel, you know, I carry that with me, and all of the women that are missing from the museum in its narration of history, all of the artists of color, but also all of the artists who, because they were deemed too minor to be represented um, in those histories is one of the, the big projects that I am, am embarking on and will need a lot of coaching with. Um, <laughs> um, because it's, it, it is the task of this, um, it, it should have been the task of every generation of museum leader uh, to date, but it, if it hasn't been, now is the moment where we can't wait any longer. Um, thirding, the mother. 100% my mother, also a single mother, made a very specific decision to raise the family on the south side of Chicago because she wanted us to be in a place with a really active intellectual and black cultural life. And my mother would drag us to like street fairs and dance classes were really important um, because this is where you saw not only movement, African history, but also shamanism, right? All those things were wrapped up in these community practices so that some of the artists that I gravitated toward um, in uh, my shows and works were, of course, the artists that I showed you today, those who were doing this work between music and visual art, uh, shamanism, even if Terry Atkins is nothing, he, is a, he was a shaman. Um, but also women who did this really interesting multidisciplinary practice often starting in dance 
and then moving to the visual arts. So these would be Senga Ngudi, um, uh, Leslie Hewitt was a dancer, Marin Hassinger was a dancer, and then found their way thinking about objects through movement, then moving into visual arts. And then I just have to acknowledge, I mean, um, you all have seen I'm a nerd at the end of the day, probably not really <laughs> a museum leader. I'm just, you know, I love reading and writing, basically. No, I love reading. Um, <laughs> But the, all that is to say that there is a series of really important women who have inspired me to think deeply about history, um, to recapture those stories. Um, those are Kelly Jones, um, oh, uh, Deb Willis is incredible, someone who raised her son to be a feminist, and that's another important practice, raised everyone of every gender to be feminist. Um, Thelma Golden, especially an amazing institutional thinker, and Lowry Stokes Sims. You know, the first black woman to get a PhD, work at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but who always said she does this work as a mission, right? Not to just like sort of leave this pile of scholarship behind her and add to her CV, but she's doing this as service to and for her community. Thank you so much. I would, uh, thank you all. This was very um, important uh, information to be shared with, and uh, thank you for opening your hearts as well. Uh, after that, maybe some questions will be difficult <laughs> to ask, but please, uh, if you have any, the crew is quite wild, and yes, we have one there. Um. Ah, hello. Mine is very quick. I'm from Kazakhstan, so shamanism, oral tradition, super important. And uh, we think a lot about you know, this decolonial turn and how do we set aside from uh, 19th century and beyond. Uh, how do we preserve oral tradition and how will it shape physical properties of the spaces of the museum? Uh, you know, if we walk, uh, let's say, Anna Mindeta, right, it's documentation, but uh, do you think it will change the physical properties of the museums of the future, like the way we treat this demodernization? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an amazing question and hard to answer on the fly, but I will say that my immediate answer to preserving oral traditions is um, imperfectly. Right. It's important to do that work, but also to understand that part of the beauty of oral traditions is the mutability. Right? You have to both trust it, but to let it change. But to also do that work, so the other th important thing that started on the south side of Chicago was this notion of oral histories, I mean, as a kind of you know, professional advocacy. Um, and so that means you have to take the time to interview people, to do the work, um, to get those stories down and actually rethink the ways in which you might um, imagine a practice. When I did my show on Howardina Pendale, I found a, um, what was supposed to be an anonymous um, testimony about a performance she saw in the middle of a field where this woman lay down and sort of lit fire around her silhouette. And she was clearly talking about Anna Mendieta. Um, but in many ways, I hadn't thought about her work in relationship to Anna Mendieta before, but that began to open up new paths to thinking about um, Howardina's relationship to the body which is exactly now how I think about her work, not as objects, but kind of a leftover of a performance. And then lastly, I would reiterate the point that I made in my talk, which is trust the knowledge that is inside of communities. I think this is done, um, the ecological work has done a lot in talking to, especially indigenous communities, about what did the landscape look like when you were a child? And that allows people to think about um, sort of returning land back to a quote unquote more natural state. But it is actually doing that oral history work and asking simple questions of people you don't traditionally consider experts to allow you to guide a practice in the future. Um, maybe I'll only just add to that. It was a very beautiful response um, that we tend to think of history, capital H, 
and or we know it to be that history which is written by the victor. And so the beauty and the potential of oral histories is that they're specifically not written by the victor and thus allow all of these inroads to dismantling the capital H and, and allowing us to understand that, that histories are manifold. Um, and if museums can play a role in that, if they can support it, make it possible, apply their resources to it, um, this is a very important task. I also think oral histories about the works in our museums need to be commissioned. The ways that we, we you know, we know that, I, I, actually I haven't checked this, when does titling actually start for the works of art? But we know that it's a relatively modern phenomenon, and yet so many titles for works were imposed on them, and, and yet our our questions and our conditions have changed. So do we have to then, as a responsibility of museum leaders, go back into and retitle these works to ask questions about who decided that that was an appropriate way to, you know, a moniker to add to something? And what could retitling already open up in reconsidering how we look at stories? I, I guess in relation to oral histories, and uh, what you said, different types of experts. I guess for me, I've been working around a lot about this idea of asking objects what they want. Yes. So this is how we began the meditation earlier, is because, you know, especially in ethnographic museums, most objects were made for a purpose, usually a spiritual cultural purpose. And so when we put them in museums behind glass, um, they're not allowed to fulfill their own destinies, their own agencies. And so the, the object dies and also part of us dies. And I really believe that is one of the causes of dis-ease um, and mental health issues in the fact that we, in the West, for example, we see everything in a kind of dead earth logic. We think that every, you know, every object, that's what it is. It's just the material. And when you disconnect from the spirit and the animistic side, this is what causes soul ease, uh, disease. It means that you um, are allowing yourself to be open to things like depression, anxiety, all the contemporary issues we have is really because we're disconnected with nature on a bigger scale and our own nature. And so in museums, for example, that really starts with the objects all those millions of objects in collections and buried, you know, in um, climate-controlled spaces. Um, this is a problem. It really is a kind of mental illness we have um, in terms of how we see things, um, in terms of conquering, possession, ownership. Um, and so um, one thing, it's not just about restitution, giving objects back. It's, it's not that simple. It's really about understanding um, that we're disconnected from ourselves. Um, just a simple example with totem poles, for example, they're made uh, for a cultural ritual and they're meant to be outside, they're meant to feel the wind, they're meant to have the rain, they're meant to decompose. Um, and then when we put them inside museums, um, yeah, the objects are sad. And you can see it and feel it, um, Especially, for example, in the British Museum uh, with the Egyptian objects. These are objects that were never meant to be seen. It is um, actually um, disturbing. Like, if, you're, if you have um, a, an ability to connect with objects, you can see that the objects are, yeah, have their own pain. And that comes back to us. It's a karmic thing. Um, so, yeah, I think we really have to think about how we value and why we collect and, yeah, do objects have to stay perfect forever? Can they have a new life, you know? Um, yeah. Can I just add one little bit to that too? I'm so sorry, I feel like Natasha, I'm taking over. <laughs> but, but, but this is so generative even for me. Um, but Grace, even your point too about um, objects and their unfulfilled desires isn't even just about a sort of karmic psychic thing too. I mean, oftentimes the story that's told about colonial conquest is about military might, 
right? Again, the kind of superiority of the northern western European nations to go into these brown and black areas and just overtake their inferior technology, when in fact, a lot of their inability to actually resist colonization was because so many of those objects that had been taken away were those objects that gave many individuals the authority to do things like call up an army, right? right? So these aren't just about you know, the ways in which there is a pain that circulates between the individual and the per person, but about a social instability that starts when certain objects are taken out of a community. And after that social instability, you get the prime conditions for colonialism. Casper yeah. um, Sotomaitis, I was very intrigued by the idea of um, inward and outward uh, change in museum philosophy. So as someone who doesn't really come from the art world, um, I'm wondering what, what would you say to this, the, the popular mind, the, the, the people who you know, take a phone and go to the Tate or the Musée d'Orsay or the Sedelic or the Art Institute of Chicago and leave with a gigabyte full of pictures, sort of looking at these um, is, you know, classical works of art or, or pieces of art in general and look at them as things of authority in, in themselves. You know, you, you enter a museum, it's, it has a name, like Guggenheim, for, 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 for an example. So how, what would you say to, to, to you know, how, how do you engage uh, this, this, this person who by default sees the museum as something that is authority in itself? <laughs> a specialist of authority now. Um, <laughs> um, what I would say to them is please come back. Please, please come back because that thing you photographed today, I hope will not be the same thing that is on view. Um, and I'm, now we're speaking of like even a permanent collection uh, in three months, six months, one year that it is my hope that in every permanent collection there is this movement to realize that the canon, the authority, the authority of those names that we all know, Picasso, Matisse, uh, Delacroix, etc., that they are not inalienable rights bestowed on those men, white men they are subject to change, subject to interpretation, that they should be sort of placed alongside a renewed understanding of what the canon is and what it can be or what it shouldn't be and what needs to come in its place. And that it is the responsibilities of museums to be constantly vigilant about re-monitoring re these histories and active in rewriting them. We know museums are the locus for uh, a very physical writing of history in our bodies, in our, um, in our viewerships. And so we have the responsibility to constantly sort of rewrite those histories for the person that might come back sometime later and take a new set of photos, um, which would undermine the idea that the first set is like the canon of great artworks. And instead there would be artists of color, um, female artists, um, geographies that are not Western and, and sort of the dominant stories that our museums are too often telling. So please come back, that's what I would say. <laughs> that's that, yeah. <laughs> I think also, Casper, you may ask, uh, you may be asking, how do we behave in an era where so much of our life is mediated by the image more so than a relationship to the object? Um, and that is a hard question because I think our first instinct is to judge those who have the primary relationship to the image. Um, and I've just had to learn to stop judging that and do exactly that. Invite them back and invite them to say that this is not just about seeing but developing a relationship with an object too. Um. I'll say something controversial then right. <laughs> afterwards. Um, for me, I guess I see museums as one of the few uh, sanctuaries in a city, and we have to preserve that. You know, like we have to preserve our libraries, we have to preserve, you know, our parks, places where we can slow down, you know, and have different types of forms of contemplation. 
uh, places that, that can be quiet in the city because every day we're bombarded by advertisement, shopping, and I don't necessarily think that's the role of the museum. I think the museum, you know, it's on twofold. I see it. It's a democratic institution, public museums, and they belong to everybody. Um, but it's also a place that can feel at home, um, you know, where you can take your shoes off. I mean, this is, I'm very insistent in all my exhibitions that people take their shoes off. And you have this sense of, you know, slowing down. Um, just because it's a, a, a place where you can have a different type of conversation than you, you do normally, you know. And so I really think we need to preserve that. And, um, and also, yes, we all live in this age of Instagram and everything, um, but we shouldn't let that be, take over. We shouldn't think that's the norm, you know, just because the technology is pervasive and it's everywhere and it's powerful. I really do think we need to preserve our humanity by, yeah, actually sometimes saying no. Um, now's not the time. Now is the time to go inward, you know, uh, instead of external and outward. So, yeah, that's what I'd say. But also listening again to the wind that has been Chase, like he, the wind is here since we started uh, today, and I thought first that it was actually the soundtrack of Grace, and I was like, wow, that's really amazingly subtle, and I thought that you're doing something on your shamanic drums also, and I was like, wow, that. But actually, also, so thinking about what if public is also not just human but non human public, and how can that be extended? Uh, when we go outwards from the walls and allow the wind to speak or uh, allow uh, animals to be part of it. At Cité des Arts, where we are, we, have, we are co-living with um, rats and mice and uh, cockroaches have been around, as you have heard. So all this is also affecting, in a way, or, or should affect, in a way, much more in this uh, non-human turn as it's called or I don't know how they call it but just going back to what is actually where we are from and what what is nature um, I think we it is a field also that could be elaborated more and is already being thought about as well we, I'm sorry no we unfortunately we would love to talk and we enjoy talking very much and there'll be tea and coffee afterwards uh, but we've really reached the end of the time that we have for the program. So thank you so much, <laughs> Natasha and Grace and Elena and Naomi. Yeah. That was uh, incredible. Thank you so much to our colleagues um, who've hosted us, Francois, Yoan, Manon, Ava, Colleen, and the technicians and the hosts, thank you, and the translators, thank you truly. Um, the uh, online chat book is online. We will have a further launch in Rotterdam uh, on November the 10th with a keynote by Denise Ferreira de Silva, which will also be online. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. <laughs> <laughs>